Well, let's have a, a moment of prayer, and then we're going to start with part two of our series on biblical wisdom. Father, we love you so much, and we're grateful, God, that you have made your wisdom available, Lord, uh, to everybody. Uh, God, we want that wisdom to be coupled with the fear of the Lord. Yes. Jesus, we don't want to exercise wisdom uh, in a cunning way. Lord, in a, a self-interested way, as we've looked at uh, even just last week. God, I pray that our pursuit of the fear of God would cause us to use wisdom in a way that benefits the church, it advances your kingdom, it saves the lost, O oh God. Uh, as we look further into the book of Proverbs today, give us poise and balance, O oh God. Help us to see where we need to apply wisdom to our lives. Give us a deeper understanding of the fear of God. We ask all these things in Jesus' name, amen and amen. All right, so just to kick us off with uh, a bit of discussion again, Proverbs often compares and contrasts multiple concepts to communicate one main truth. How many can you find in chapter two? So just for a few minutes, let's take about five to seven, just with the people at your table. Read through chapter two and look for the comparison specifically. So where are two things being shown as similar and where are two things being shown as opposites of each other? So comparison would be similarity. Contrast would be differences. And what's being communicated? So how many comparisons and contrasts can you find in chapter 2? Just do like a quick count. I'll give you about five minutes, and uh, we'll hear what you, what you uncover. Go right ahead. All right. What did you find? What did you notice? Some of them are really broad like whole paragraphs, but then others are just a line or two. What'd you, what'd you notice? Either comparison or contrast. Well, there had to be something. <laughs> well, here, let's, we'll look together then. How about that? Okay. Well, here, the, the simplest one to notice is at the end of the chapter. Take a look at, uh, verse, uh, verses 20 through 22. Now I'm reading from the ESV. It says, so you will walk in the way of the good and keep to the paths of the righteous. For the upright will inhabit the land and those with integrity will remain in it, but the wicked will be cut off from the land and the treacherous will be rooted out of it. Okay, so that's a really easy contrast to notice. You've got a line about the fate of the upright contrasted with the fate of the wicked. Okay, so if you're upright, you remain in the land, you stay established, you can thrive and flourish. And it's the promised land, so there's this idea of being in the will of God. But if you walk in the way of the wicked, well, you don't get established. You don't flourish. Your life goes into a pattern of destruction. They'll be rooted out of the land. This idea of exile, removal from God's will and presence is there. Now, the verses before that, there's comparison and contrast, but it's like whole paragraphs that are taking place there. Uh, well, Raphael, you agreed with me. What did you see? <laughs> well, um, I see in verse 9, uh, like starting at verse 9, then you will yes. understand what is right, just, and fair, and you will find what is the right way to go. Wisdom will answer your heart, and knowledge will fill you with joy. Mm -hmm. And then it says wise choices, watch over you, but then it talks about the evil people. And right. What, you know, the comparison and contrast there. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like you have all these qualities of walking in wisdom. They're all good. They're virtuous. They're right. And if you do that, it'll deliver you from the opposite. Yeah. Look at the life of those who don't walk in wisdom. You're not going to be like them and you will not share in their destiny or in their fate. Uh, and it goes on in verse 16, you'll be delivered from the forbidden woman. Like that's a kind of literal translation. Hebrew, it also could mean strange. And it's talking about an adulteress uh, from the adulteress with her smooth words, who forsakes the companion of her youth, forgets the covenant of her God. Her house sinks down to death, her paths to the dead. None who go to her come back, nor do they regain the paths of life. So again, you have some of the things we talked about last week. There's this extreme language of finality attached to the way that you regard wisdom or folly. If you choose wisdom, there's an end result, and it doesn't get into the in-between. It, it moves from decision to destiny really quickly. It wants you to see that this is an urgent matter of life and death. If you choose folly, it's destruction. It doesn't get into the in-between. There's no like calls to repentance necessarily, like in the prophets pleading with Israel, why will you die? Why will you keep on seeking your sin? Turn from those ways. Proverbs is like, nope, you make your choice. That's it. And again, that's to communicate urgency. 
It doesn't mean there is no second chance. There is nothing redemptive. It's not that. It's just making it urgent. You want to set the pattern of your life early. You want to set it as soon as possible. And so when we look at these uh, comparisons and contrasts that are being made in chapter two, largely what they're communicating is again, this idea that choosing wisdom is the only path to life. Rejecting wisdom is a certain path to destruction. And that's what's being communicated over and over and over again. And again, you have this idea of relationships coming into play. So look at um, verse 12. It says, delivering you from the way of evil, from men of perverted speech, who forsake the paths of uprightness. So there's people involved here. So it's not just abstract choices about what you believe. It's even who and what you associate with. And in verse 16, there's another relationship, the adulteress. So Proverbs isn't just telling us to make, you know, internal decisions about what we're going to think is right and wrong and how we're going to define these things, but even outwardly, the way that you live and express yourself, what do you connect yourself with? Who are you associated with? And how is that shaping what you are becoming? So comparison and contrast, there's this inherent relational quality to it that it wants us to see. Whoever you connect with, even Paul says this, bad company does what? Corrupts good morals. Your mama told you that. You might not know it was from the Bible, but it was from the Bible. I never knew it was the first, but I got told it over and over again. Okay, so going into our notes, though, let's talk about obtaining the fear of Yahweh. Obtaining the fear of Yahweh. Learning to walk in the fear of God is a deliberate and desperate endeavor. It's a deliberate and desperate endeavor. Uh, the student, again, he's speaking to a student, one who is also regarded as a son. The student must give the full attention of his mind to the fatherly voice in the text. Look at verses one and two. It says, my son. Okay, so this is a father speaking. He's not just a student hearing from his teacher. This is a son. If you receive my words and treasure up my commandments with you, making your ear attentive to wisdom and inclining your heart uh, to understanding. So he's saying, listen, pay attention. Listen to everything I'm telling you. Store up these things in your heart. It's the full attention of his mind. Um, now, do you know in Hebrew, specifically Old Testament Hebrew, there was no word for brain. They didn't really know what to make of it. Like even the Egyptians, what would they do when they were, you know, getting bodies ready for mummification? They would just kind of take a hook, swish everything around up there and pull it out. You know, the heart was actually believed to be the seat of not just emotion, but of intellect. Your heart was where you made all your decisions and all your planning. And, and, and it's kind of helpful to think of it that way because in the West, we kind of have this strong division between the mind and the heart, what I think and what I feel. And those things are a lot more together than you realize. Um, let's think about what we, what we believe about Jesus. Uh, that's not just a matter of what you feel. It's also a matter of what you think. It's not just what you think. It's also what you feel. You want to think the right thing about Jesus, because there's people out there who believe in the wrong Jesus, right? That's a problem. There are wrong Jesuses out there who can't actually save. Um, so it's not just what you think of him, but then do you love that Jesus that you believe in? I mean, just saying the statement, I love Jesus, like that's loaded right there. That's not an intellectual statement. It's an emotional one. You know, I, I love him. And what is it that I love? What moves me to have that affection for him? Well, it's the things that I've come to know about him. I, I know that he's good. I know that he's merciful. I know that he loved me in the deadness of my sin. He made a way for me to be adopted uh, into God's family rather than an enemy uh, of God's family. Like those are all reasons that I've come to know and they have influenced the way that I feel about him. These things go together. So in the Old Testament, it's all the heart. The heart is where all those things happen. They're not divided from each other. And so when he says to his son, receive my words, treasure them, make your ear attentive, he's speaking to his mind. I want you to think about these things and make them a part of your, a part of your life. The student must pray earnestly for understanding. And that's something we should still do today. God, give me understanding, open my mind so that I can know you and be like you. And the student must actively pursue wisdom. So these first five verses, okay, receive my words, treasure my commands, make your ear attentive, incline your heart, call out for insight, raise your voice for understanding, seek it like silver, search for it like treasure. You get the idea? Urgency. 
Okay, go after this with everything in you. It's an active pursuit. We don't just sit back and chillax in church and just by osmosis become increasingly wise. No, God wants you to chase him. He wants you to bring him into your daily decisions. He wants you to make him a regular part of how you evaluate and assess the way you've got to handle life. Okay, you know, you can, it's funny, I have a, I have an interesting relationship with people who, and because I, I hear people make statements like this, I don't even brush my teeth unless Jesus tells me to in the morning. And, and they're not being metaphorical, man. Like, it's not a metaphor. They really mean that. I have an interesting relationship with people of that mentality. I'm, there's a part of me that's like, that's a little much, you know. It's, that, that, that must be hard to live like that, you know, because like, I don't hear the Lord clearly till after I've had my first cup of coffee, you know. So it, I just, I, there's something about it. Like, I, that caffeine just helps me. Ah, there you are, Jesus, you know. It's, it's easier to hear him and connect with him, you know. Um, so there's one level where I, I appreciate that, where it's like, hey, I'm glad that you feel that close with the Lord and, and you are so desperate to hear his voice. But then at the same time, you don't wanna, you wanna watch out for the other imbalances that can come in with that kind of mentality. It's like, look, just do everyone a favor. Whether Jesus tells you or not, brush your teeth. <laughs> Even if he, there are things that he probably shouldn't need to tell you, you know what I mean? It's kind of like, I want him to tell me when to do everything. Like your mom doesn't even feel that way. Your mom wants you to do stuff because you know you're supposed to. And the Lord is probably, that's probably his fingerprint on your mother's life. It's like, just, you should do that. Just do it, you know? Um, but again, there's this active pursuit where you want God's voice to be a regular part of your day and how you evaluate, how you assess. That's a good thing. Uh, the poem in chapter two aims to rescue the young man from multiple things. So verses 12 and 16 in particular, the poems in those verses, uh, he wants to rescue them from corrupt companions, speaking of evil men and the adulterous woman. It's meant to rescue him from greed. In verses 12 through 15, it's easy money. Verses 16 through 19, it's easy intimacy. Uh, and then from violence, the way of evil, the violation of the marriage covenants. And if you remember from last week, these are the same three categories we saw in chapter one. And that's really important because you think about the way these things affect daily living. When you have corrupt companions, no matter what they look like, if you have corrupt companions, it's going to deeply affect the trajectory of your life. If you're greedy, you're hungry for money, you're hungry for that which satisfies maybe your baser instincts, uh, it's not going to go well for you. Okay, So there's something fundamental about these three vices that Proverbs is calling our attention to. Hey, if you can make your life free of corrupt companions, greed, and violence, you're going to be okay. And the way that it depicts violence here, you have evil men. Uh, chapter one, it's specifically evil men who will take advantage of the vulnerable. And then here there's this added idea of people who violate the marriage covenant. Um, and we talked a bit about the Euthyphro dilemma last week, and everyone was nice and confused about that. Uh, why does God forbid adultery? Is it just because he chose to? No, because God could have permitted adultery then. Uh, is it because adultery is just bad and so God's command reflects that? No, because then God's obeying something. He doesn't obey anything. He doesn't submit to a law that exists out there apart from him. No, God forbids adultery because it's the opposite of what he's like. He's faithful, and that's why unfaithfulness is sin. Okay, so just to revisit that concept, it's, a, it's an important one in the book of Proverbs. Um, the poem opens by reflecting on God's loving generosity. Verses one through six, it's clear he will certainly give wisdom to those who seek it. So in the midst of this urgency, store up the command, seek it like silver. At the end of it, verses five and six, it says, then you will understand the fear of the Lord. So yeah, there's this responsiveness that we're meant to have. Hey, it's out there, so I'm gonna go after it. And God's guarantee is, look, if you go after it, I'm gonna give it to you. No good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly, it says in the psalm. Uh, he lovingly guards those who seek wisdom. In verses 7 through 10, he stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk in integrity, guarding the paths of justice and watching over the way of his saints. So God watches over those who are in alignment with his heart and with his character. The poem closes 
by reflecting on God's righteous judgment. The righteous will be blessed, verses 20 through 21. The wicked will be punished, verse 22. And you can't, you can't get away from those realities. That Again, think back to last week. Look at the, the wisdom literature examples we, we took a peek at from Israel in the Old Testament and then from Egypt. They were so strikingly similar that it's very possible that some of the Hebrew Proverbs are based on Egyptian ones, but what's the key difference? What was the difference between the two Proverbs, the Egyptian ones and the Old Testament ones? Anybody remember? What's that? Monotheism? Okay, let's get more personal than, that is true, monotheism, but make it more personal. You have a God, a living God at the center of Hebrew wisdom that isn't there in Egyptian wisdom. So just because the principles and the commands look the same, that doesn't mean they're equal. Because in Egypt it was, hey, don't falsify the scales because that's just a good idea. In the Bible it's, no, don't falsify the scales because there's a just God who rules over this universe and you're answerable to him. The idea of accountability lies at the heart of uh, of Hebrew wisdom. And, you know, let me go off on a bit of a rabbit trail here for just a moment. I've been thinking about this for a little while now. Like when we preach the gospel, what are the things we're meant to be telling people? You know, very often we'll make the statement, you know, you want to give your life to Jesus because he will change your life. That's true. I think that needs to be a bit more secondary in the way that we present it, though. And, and here's why. How many of you have heard of uh, Jordan Peterson? Okay. I, I really enjoy listening to him. I do. But there gets the point, and there, it, there come points where I can only take so much of what he's saying because he's talking really good stuff. He's a sound thinker. I'm like, this guy's saying things the church should have been saying for a long time. He really is. But then he's not a Christian. And so that begins to come out, and, you know, the way he'll approach certain ideas, the way he handles the Bible. He does not have uh, a a Christian worldview in that sense. And uh, the thing that makes me bring him up right now is because millions of people follow this guy, particularly young men, and they all say the same thing. Your book changed my life. Your lectures rescued me from depression and suicidal thoughts. He's not preaching Jesus to them. He's not. And so there's this reality that it made my heart wrestle with, like, God, I thought People could only really change and achieve transformation, positive transformation with you. But you've got this whole crowd of people, like they're, they're accomplishing something very real without you. What do we do with that, you know? And so there's a couple conclusions I've drawn out of that. And it, it, what we're looking at in Proverbs speaks to it. In theology, they call it common grace. You know, because we're image bearers, there are certain things we're able to do that are positive and good and right. It's like unsaved parents do genuinely love their kids. Thank God. Even if they're unsaved, they love their kids enough to not kill them and feed them. And you can have parent-child relationships that are actually quite healthy and quite good. You know, So there are things we can do positively because we are image bearers. And God has bestowed that grace on us as a race because he loves us. And he's not a cruel tyrant. And he doesn't want this world to be completely overrun by our internal evil. It's true. And so it seems that people can even achieve a level of change, positive change in their own lives without ever repenting and giving their lives to Christ. But that doesn't make them born again. Because what's the first call of the gospel? When you read and when you read the gospels themselves and either John or Jesus are preaching, what's the first thing they say? Repent. The first thing we should be saying when we preach the gospel is not come to Jesus so he can change your life. It's like, no, come to Jesus because you've offended God and you can't redeem yourself out of that. None of the positive change that you can go through. Look, going on that trajectory might make a person more open to God. Look at Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. He's a pagan. But he understands like there's something about this Hebrew God that's different. And so he starts worshiping like the Jews and living like the Jews. And he's like, hey, this, this stuff really works. And what does the angel tell him when he appears to him? Hey, Cornelius, 
your offerings, he specifically says your offerings and your works have come up as a memorial before God, but you still need to hear the real gospel. Sent to Joppa for a man called Peter. And so it's like, all right, there's stuff that humans can really accomplish and they're actually validating things. They're good things, but those things are merely evidence of the fact that you're an image bearer. That doesn't mean you're not God's enemy anymore. And so this idea of fearing God, where should wisdom ultimately take us? It's got to bring us back to the fact that, hey, we're accountable to a supreme being. And it's, it's not going to be enough for you to say, well, I, I really did change my life for the better while I was alive. It's like, yeah, but I was never your king. And who, who did you give credit for that? Well, that self-help author that you enjoyed reading, or you pulled yourself up by your own bootstraps. You are not your own savior. Because though we cannot wash ourselves of our, of our sin. Uh, only the blood of Jesus can do that. And that's a good segue even to the next section, personal trust and a personal God. We are here reminded in chapter three that the pursuit of wisdom is ultimately the pursuit of God himself. It's ultimately the pursuit of God himself. In chapter three, my son, do not forget my teaching. Let your heart keep my commandments for length of days and years of life and peace they will add to you. Let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the, tab the tablet of your heart. You will find favor, good success in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding in all your ways. Okay, so in the first five, uh, four verses, it's all about, don't forget my teaching, keep my commandments. Uh, they're going to add peace to you, steadfast love and everything. But then it jumps to trust the Lord with all your heart in all your ways. Well, wait, isn't the way of seeking wisdom enough? And the father's like, no, it's not like that. You're, you're not pursuing a, a concept. You're not pursuing a lifestyle. You're pursuing a person. And that's very different. Go after him. Trust him with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. We must trust toward rather than just, re we must trust toward Yahweh rather than rely toward our own ability. So I put toward there because it's a bit more awkwardly literal from the Hebrew. It, it speaks of direction. Where are you leaning? Where are you placing your weight? What are you resting yourself on? Well, it should be God. Because if you're trying to lean and rest your weight on your own understanding, it's going to break underneath you. It's not going to work. You're going to end up stumbling and, and falling. Acknowledging God in all our ways is being aware of him and fellowshipping with him. Now, I should, have, I should have changed this. I wish I had. When I was taking Hebrew in seminary, my professor specifically went over this verse and he said, honestly, acknowledging is too weak. Like this is the word for knowing relationally. So when it says, in all your ways acknowledge him, it's really, in all your ways know him. In all your ways draw near to him relationally. That's the idea that's being communicated. It's not just, hey, God, it's all you today. You know, uh, if, if you will, if the Lord wills, I'll go do this and that and the other. No, there's something more intimate to it than that. Way more intimate. In all your ways know him, fellowship with him, draw near to him. Giving our trust and affection to Yahweh leads to the straightening of our paths. He will guide us into a morally upright life. Uh, that's the primary meaning here. Okay, so him straightening our paths uh, is primarily about a morally upright life that pleases him. And then it's also secondarily guiding us into his will for our life, you know? guiding us into his will. And the reason why I like to emphasize this is because I've been this person and I've met other people who are constantly agonizing over, God, what is your will? What is your will? You been there before? It can be like, ugh, if I breathe wrong, am I going to ruin my life? Am I going to be a second-class Christian? Uh, am I going to miss the will of God? It's like, listen, falling into the will of God should be a very natural thing. It's supernatural, we know that, but it's a very natural thing. You're walking with him. If your main concern is, God, I, I want to know you, and I trust that as I give my affection to you and I, I endeavor to be intimate with you, you're going to make me walk the kind of walk you want me to. And as a result, I'm going to wind up exactly where I'm supposed to be. There are times of critical decision-making that can feel cloudy and uncertain, and in those moments, you, you deal with them appropriately. But whether you should go to Walmart shouldn't fall under this category. Whether you should brush your teeth, because I live there, man, and that's why I've got sympathy toward the folks who are like, I can't brush my teeth. With I, I remember having anxiety 
uh, at a point in my life. This is a long time ago about, well, should I go to Walmart today and, and get more deodorant? What if I'm needed here? And what if, I, like literally, it's bad, man. It's religious bondage. Yeah. It's religious bondage. You don't want to live like that. It's like, no, just take a breath. <laughs> Love Jesus. You're going to wind up exactly where you should be. Yeah. You're going to wind up exactly where you should be. Yeah. Sam? Nick, um, do you think that the reason why some of that happens is because people are immature in their faith? Yeah, I think it's a mix. It's immaturity, but it's more in, uh, insecurity. I, that specifically, that fear and anxiety over, am I going to miss God's will? Like that's insecurity and in his love. Because it's like you put more weight on your ability to make a mistake than you do on God's ability to keep you. Amen. That's the reason why we feel that way sometimes. Like I was afraid about going to Walmart because I really thought like I can, my emphasis was I can really mess this up. <laughs> you know, I can miss everything. And it's like, he, you, you can't make mistakes, but he's a little stronger than you are. He's just a bit stronger than you. And he's a bit more faithful than you are unfaithful, you know? So it is immaturity, but I think more importantly, it's insecurity. And th that when that gets corrected, when, when God's love begins to be understood and grasped, by our hearts, that stuff drops away. Raphael? I love that, that he says uh, he'll make our path straight. Yeah. He doesn't say, I'll make you walk on a straight path. He'll say, he says, where you walk, I'll make it straight. Mm. Kind of like, you know, uh, you know, all things will work together for good. Right. For your life. So <coughs> no fear in taking a step because as we acknowledge him. Yeah then we know wherever we step our feet as we acknowledge him and, and seek his will and ask him to guide us mm -hmm. in that he's going to direct our path and make it straight. So yeah. That's pretty awesome. Okay, so here's, I, I'll tell you a little story. I don't share this often. Um, I don't care for this rule of thumb that sometimes, and I hear it in our preaching circle, and I appreciate the way that it's put because it's never put like this ironclad rule, this is the way you discern the will of God. But I've heard people just in, in other churches and elsewhere talk about there's only one way to know that it's God's will for your life. You've got to feel peace about it. I don't agree with that because I can't tell you how many times I've had to make a decision with no peace about anything, just utter turmoil in every direction. It's like, well, I can't stay where I am. I've got to go right or I've got to go left. I don't have a choice. And if you base your decisions off of how you feel, you could really end up making mistakes. And this is where I'm being vulnerable. If I had believed that were true, my wife and I wouldn't have Noah. Because I got it in my head that God was going to give us a girl. Like the first child we adopted would be a girl. I, I had myself convinced that he'd spoken that to me. And so I had that in the back of my mind. And then we got the letter from his birth mom uh, and everything through the agency. We're like, we knew this is what God wants us to do. Like we're going for it. We were so excited to meet her. And when she told us it was a boy, the bottom dropped out from under me in my heart. And I couldn't tell my wife. I couldn't. Because she's like, we're going to have a baby boy. Like she's just over the moon. And I'm like, I'm going to destroy her if I say this, because I don't know if I'm right. Now, ordinarily, because I'd never had it in a situation that intense. You know, it's like, well, you just do whatever you feel good about, and that's, that's how you discern God's will. But now it's like, whoa, this really matters. This is like a life and death. I'm going to destroy my wife if I impose this on her. But what if this is God telling me, oh, we're, we're getting into a bad situation. This isn't the birth mom we're supposed to connect with. You know, what if, what if this is, and that was the battle going on. So she's like over the moon, dancing through the aisles of home goods, looking for all these boy things that we're gonna take home and decorate that room. And I'm pushing the cart like this. Like, why, I'm like, what am I doing? No, it was awful. It was awful. Like, that's religious slavery. I should have been dancing with her through the aisles. Like it should have been like yellow brick road, man. Where was, it, that's what it should have been like. And I've got no capacity for it because I've got this area of slavery in my mind. I don't feel peace. I don't feel peace. I don't feel, listen, I've had the privilege of experiencing the genuine peace of God about decisions plenty of times. So I'm not saying that's wrong. I'm just saying that's not the only way. We have to believe that God is more faithful than we are uncertain. 
he is way more faithful than we are uncertain. And it was crazy because he never spoke to me. So like, I still remember the first time I, I forced it down. I just forced it down. I was like, I'm not doing this. And I, I faked my way through the three days between when we met his birth mother and when he was born. Just, I, I didn't know what else to do, you know, because I was like, I'm not doing this to Christina. I'm not putting this on her. And whether that was right or wrong, I don't know. But that's what I did. And so when he was born, it was every bit of magic that it's supposed to be the first time you hold your child. <laughs> now, what was crazy was that didn't change everything. It became one of those situations with when I, when I was with him and I was with her, I was like, there is absolutely nothing wrong with this. Yeah. He was born in Lidditz. And so what I was doing was while, she, while he was in the hospital uh, with uh, his birth mom and with Christina, um, I was driving back and forth an hour to work every day, come back. So those hour long drives by myself alone with my thoughts, all the turmoil would come up like a geyser. And I'd have to bed it down by, by the time I got to work. And then I would have it bubble up again, driving back to the hospital and have to, but then every time I was with him, I'm like, how long is this going to go on? You know? And to be honest, it just kind of died. I forget when it fully hit me. I was like, why am I still questioning this? Like, what do I believe? It wasn't just, what do I believe about my son? I was like, what do I believe about you? Amen. What do I really think you're like? You know, what, how strong and how powerful do I really believe you are? And it just killed all the anxiety. It killed all the fear, you know? And, and it's like, this is why verses like this have so much power to keep us in the way that we should go. We don't always know which way to go. And it's not always as clear as just follow the peace of God. It's like, where is it? I don't, I don't know where it is. I can't, there's just chaos at every turn, you know? He's always faithful. Regardless of how you feel, he's always faithful. And that you get that for free. Amen. All right. That was not in the notes. Truly acknowledging God in all our ways is evidenced by, first of all, the submission of all our thinking to God's rule. The submission of all our thinking to God's rule. Don't be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord. Turn away from evil. Okay, so it's God's rule. He's in charge. The submission of all of our finances to God's rule. So our thinking, don't be wise in your own eyes. If your thinking doesn't align with God's, it's foolishness. Uh, our finances, honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your produce, and the submission of all our ways to God's rule. Do not despise the Lord's discipline or be weary of his reproof. The Lord reproves him who he loves as a father, the son in whom he delights. So truly acknowledging God in all of our ways is evidenced by submission. Every aspect of our lives being marked by submission to his rule. He is king. He's in charge. We are at his disposal in whatever way he pleases. That's the true evidence that you know him, that you acknowledge him in all of your ways. Okay, final section, because we're coming up on 10 o'clock here. <laughs> Listening for lady wisdom. Had some good tangents today, though, I think. <laughs> Listening for lady wisdom. Proverbs 1 through 9 are a collection of poems about the nature and effects of wisdom. Okay, so wisdom's nature, it's an attribute of God. It's woven into the fabric of reality. It's obvious and available to all, and it stems from God's generosity. So these are all major principles about wisdom that you see drawn out in chapters one through nine, because uh, again, we're taking big chunks of the book together. Um, wisdom's effects, well, a right relationship with God and fellow man, you have good relationships with heaven and with earth, financial responsibility, work ethic, sexual purity and integrity, personal holiness, the avoidance of temptation. Chapter seven is a big one. That, that's an incredible poem. Uh, a young man who knows where temptation lives. And rather than staying away from that street, he thinks it's fun to kind of, is she home? Like that's literally the picture that you get in the proverb. You know, and we do that. The, the human heart likes to be tempted. And the sooner we admit that about ourselves, the more on guard we can be against it. When you admit that I like being tempted, it's like, okay, don't do the thing you like. Stay away from the stuff that you know stirs that up. Because the whole proverb is, look, stay away from that street corner because you know what lurks there. Okay? And that's a principle that we have to apply to relationships, to web surfing, to 
entertainment, name a category. And that's an idea that we have to import into that aspect of our lives. Chapter 9 closes with a warning that sin is equally obvious and available. Sin is equally obvious and available. If we go to chapter 9, very quickly, verses 13 to 18. And so we've talked about how wisdom is lifting its voice in the street. It's calling out. Well, the beginning of the chapter, it's uh, wisdom has built her house. She's hewn out its seven pillars. She slaughtered her beasts, mixed her wine. She sent out her young women to call from the highest places. Whoever is simple, let him turn in here. So there's this open, obvious invitation from wisdom. If you want to know wisdom, come in here. If you want to know the fear of God, come on in. The, the table is open. Take your seat. Well, then there's a contrast. Verse 13, the woman folly is also loud. She is seductive and knows nothing. She sits at the door of her house, takes a seat on the highest places of the town, calling to those who pass by who are going straight on their way. Whoever is simple, let him turn and hear. To him who lacks sense, she says, stolen water is sweet. Bread eaten in secret is pleasant. But he does not know that the dead are there. Her guests are in the depths of Sheol, of the grave. So as loud and obvious as wisdom is, sin is equally obvious. Sin is equally available. Sin and folly are constantly associated with death and destruction. Sin and folly are the defiance of God's wisdom and value system. Those things are out there. They are obvious. And Paul, I think, is echoing this idea a bit in Galatians 5 when he talks about the works of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit. He says both are obvious, both are evident, and both have consequences. He lists the, the works of the flesh. He says, those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Those who uh, obtain the fruit of the Spirit or produce the fruit of the Spirit, well, it's proof that they're free from the law and they have salvation, you know? So that is it for this week. It's 10 o'clock. I can give five minutes if there's any questions or comments, but then I've gotta, we've got to get upstairs. <laughs> Anything at all? Yeah, real quick. Yes, sir. As a, as a young person, so I was always raised in church and stuff. And like, I like kind of what you were talking about. Like, in my mind, like, I was always scared death to breathe because, like, you know, I was raised very strict. Right. And, like, I always thought, I basically, like, I was sitting there just waiting for that mistake to cast me away. Mm -hmm. And, like, just recently, I started going to their church. Like, basically taught me, like, your righteousness is filthy rags. Like, what you have to offer is not why God wants you. He wants mm -hmm. you because he wants you. Like, he yep. created you. He wants you. And, like, that's something that I feel like a lot of young people, like, maybe push yourself from the church because they're like, it's just a bunch of set of rules and things I can or can't do versus they don't understand that God actually loves them and wants to, you know, be God of their life. But it's hard for a young person to understand that, you know? Yeah. It's like, where does value come from? It's like, what makes something valuable? Like, it, it's wanted by someone else. I mean, I think, why do we love gold so much? Probably because it's shiny. <laughs> you know, it's just a rock, if you think about it. But it's got a lot of value because people want it. And so in and of ourselves, there's nothing about us that's desirable. We're, we can be pretty ugly, you know, but because our creator wants us so intensely that he gave the absolute treasure of heaven, his own son, to have us back, that's what gives us value. It's his love that makes us valuable, not what we bring to the table. That's the gospel. Amen. Uh, we got time for one more. Maybe two, depends, if there is one more. Going once, twice. Have a wonderful morning, guys. We'll see you next week.